Abraham Allegiance starts where Gilgamesh Immortal left off. The giant King Nimrod builds his city of Babylon, along with a temple tower, in order to become world potentate. It shows the steps of tyrannical empire that continue to plague humanity even after God's judgment of the deluge. Into this picture comes Abram, called by God to be the father of many nations, who will inherit the land of Canaan and will birth many kings. Since Nimrod is world emperor, this does not sit well with him, and he seeks to kill Abram. But Abram is protected by God. When God judges Nimrod by confusing the languages of the people and dispersing them to the ends of the earth, Nimrod loses his kingdom and sets out on a lifelong quest to find Abram and kill him in order to thwart God's plans for a seed line of God's people. But Nimrod isn't the only one working against God. Away in the land of Canaan, the goddess Ashtart is breeding the seed of the serpent through the bloodline of the cursed son of Noah, Canaan. And she's doing it in Sodom and Gomorrah. You think you know how the story ends, but there's more to it than you've ever realized, as these three will come crashing into one another as the war of the seed rises. Many people think of Abram as a nomadic shepherd, so they think of him as a rather sedentary or peaceful holy man. But in Genesis 14, we read a story about how Abram led 318 of his household trained warriors to capture his nephew Lot from the clutches of an army of men thousands strong. That's no pastoral pacifist, that's a warrior. Since the Bible only tells snippets of people's lives, we don't always know the whole story. But that snippet of Genesis 14 reveals an Abram that was obviously more than a peaceful shepherd. The Bible only starts with Abram's story when he's about 50 years old. Then it makes a few jumps from age 75 to age 100, before he has Isaac that leads into Jacob and the creation of the Hebrew nation. That's 50 years of Abram's life that we know nothing about and then another 50 about which we know almost nothing. Ancient Jewish legends try to fill in those intervening years in a way that makes the sparse biblical information make sense. It's like connecting the dots. So while I don't consider these apocryphal stories to be scriptural, they are a rich heritage of tradition from which to draw fascinating stories of people of faith. I kind of see it like my way of showing respect to the great storytellers of old by retelling their stories with freshness while drawing from their imaginative resources. Yes, there were giants in Abram's story. When the Bible talks about the kings of Mesopotamia coming into Canaan on a campaign of destruction that ends with plundering Sodom and Gomorrah, it tells of the cities they conquered along their way as belonging to those of giants. It's almost as if these Mesopotamian kings knew they had to get rid of the giants if they wanted to secure the king's highway for international trade. Also, when Israel later comes into the Promised Land under Joshua, they find the giant sons of Anak, or Anakim, fill the land. Then elsewhere in Joshua, we read that Arba was the father of Anak and was the greatest of these giants. Since this all took place in the past and there was no mention of the Anakim during Abraham's time, or any other, I figured that Arba was probably just beginning his kingdom during Abram's time and had his son Anak shortly thereafter. The Bible says that it took about 400 years from the time of Abraham's covenant to Israel taking Canaan. So that's four long generations with which Arba's giant descendants could populate the land and thus their infestation when Joshua arrives. Nobody really knows who Nimrod really was. There are as many interpretations as there are scholars, and those interpretations run the gamut of over 1,500 years of difference. Some think he was Gilgamesh during the third millennium BC. Others say he was Tekulti Ninurta who reigned about 1,500 years later. Some even say he has no known historical identity. The problem is that the Hebrew word for Nimrod means to rebel. So it is most likely a Hebrew demonized nickname rather than the real name. This is exactly what the Hebrew writers did with the name Babel, which means confusion, rather than the original name Babylon, which means gateway of the gods. 
Now, there are a lot of legends that surround Nimrod, but the most influential comes from Alexander Hislop's The Two Babylons. Unfortunately, Hislop's storytelling was made up in his own head as a way to justify his anti-Catholic polemic in the book. The ancient Jewish source that I used was the Book of Jasher, a book that some believe was one of the sources of the Bible writer's own history. So sit back and enjoy Abraham Allegiant about the forefather and patriarch you thought you knew.